continue to pray for the Baileys, please, as they continue to serve the Lord in a huge way. Okay, some other things to hit on. We did not announce, but needed to announce in the announcements this morning that next Sunday is not just the chili cook-off, which you definitely should come back after the third service and bring a friend to church. We got some empty seats, so you should fill those next week for that. But also next week is the time change. So you got to fall back or you'll be at the first service if you don't fall back. And um, so make sure you fall back, set your clocks back, your phones and stuff are going to do that anyway. uh, Also, we are now into the single digits away from the election, nine days away, which with the election fast upon us, I want to encourage you to maybe consider this week to spend some time fasting in prayer for our nation. Whatever the case, we need God to move mightily in our country, and I can guarantee you one thing is absolutely certain on November 6th, more division in our culture. And so we need to pray that God would move in a huge way. Also, as Pastor Mark mentioned in the announcements, we're starting something called the Thankful 30 for the month of November. You can go to the website ccchurch.com slash thankful30, and November is the month where we celebrate Thanksgiving, so it's a great month for us to be reminded about the important aspect of gratitude. And we're actually going to be doing a series of teachings in November on that topic as well. And one of the things I am thankful for is that we are going to finish the book of Judges today. So if you would take out your Bibles and open to the seventh book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Judges chapter 20 is where we are at. In light of the message that I gave in Judges chapter 19 last week about outrage at horrible, outrageous, moral evil. Uh, I was looking this morning at a picture I have on my iPad. I always have my notes on my iPad, but this is a picture of my family that was taken on October 6th of last year as we were in Athens, in Greece. And we were getting ready with a very large group of people, some from this church, but then other people that come and use the Enduring Word website. We were getting ready to get on a cruise ship and head on our way to Israel. In fact, two days after that, we were scheduled to be in the port of Ashdod in Israel, which is 20 miles from Gaza. The following morning, as we were just a couple of hundred miles away from Israel, on our way to Jerusalem, which is kind of the high point of these tours that I've been planning for many, many years, this was, the, this was one that I had been working on for four years. We had been working to put this together But we woke up on the 7th of October, a couple hundred miles away from the port there on our way to Jerusalem. And I don't really pay attention to the TV news. So I get my news through a lot of notifications online through social media. And I was getting bombarded with all kinds of notifications about what was happening in Israel as Hamas was attacking on October 7th, 2023. That day has now become as significant to the people in Israel as 9-11-2001 is for us here. And within several hours, because the time difference, I started to get a whole bunch of text messages and emails from people in our church and friends and family back here that were wanting to know, are you okay? Now, I'll have to say, we were more than okay because we were like in this luxurious cruise ship in the middle of the Mediterranean, but it was very evident what was happening a very short distance away from us was an absolute horror. And You know, like I said, I don't pay a lot of attention to the TV news and I try to stay away from the the images, the videos of things like that when they're happening because I don't don't know that it's best to put that into our minds and hearts, but the headlines alone were clear to make it evident that what was happening there was absolutely horrible. Our tour was diverted, of course. We didn't make it to Jerusalem. But as as the news headlines, the images and the videos spread, With that spread a massive outrage of people, and understandably so. Millions, if not billions of people were stirred to outrage and anger at that. And as I shared last week, because we were looking at a passage of scripture in Judges chapter 19 that is is twisted. It's It's a horrible, outrageous, moral evil. It happens in Judges chapter 19. And when something like that happens, Judges chapter 19, or something like what all of you witnessed in the news a year ago, or things that are equally as bad happen all around the world at any time. When we see that, I shared last week, outrageous immorality demands moral outrage. It stirs in us, and rightly so, anger, what we would call indignation. It's a great word. We are stirred with moral indignation when you see something hideous 
and heinous. The right response is anger. Paul's command in Ephesians chapter 4.26 takes hold. Be angry. And I don't know that there's a single person here this morning that's not really good at fulfilling that command. (laughs) Be angry. The hard part is there's two commands that open Ephesians 4.26. Be angry. Yes, I got it. And do not sin. And it puts us in this weird tension where we are rightly angered, what we would call righteous indignation, righteous anger. We're rightly angered at moral evil, but then we're commanded, do not sin. And that place on this fine tight wire between the two puts us in this place where we're kind of torn between two things. How do we be angry and do not sin? The events here at the close of the book of Judges beginning at chapter 19, but through what we're going to look at today in chapters 20 and 21. Chapter 20 and 20, 20 20 and 21, they are not as disturbing. The events here in this passage are not as disturbing as what triggered this response in this passage that we found in chapter 19, but it's still very strange. If you've read ahead in Judges 20 and 21, you've probably left scratching your head and going, what in the world is going on? And I'm not going to go section by section through every verse here this morning. I'm just going to summarize what's taking place. So as a bit of a summary, in chapter 19, there was a horrible moral evil committed by a group of people in the nation of Israel. The nation was divided into 12 tribes, and one of the tribes was the tribe of Benjamin. And in the territory of the tribe of Benjamin was a city called Gabeah. And there was a man who was from the tribe of Levi. He was one of the priests of the nation. He, with his wife, went into the town of Gabeah, and they stayed there that night. And there were perverted men who lived in that city who came and surrounded the home where they were staying that night and demanded that the owner of that home deliver into their hands this foreigner, if you will, still a part of the nation of Israel, but from a different city, this Levite to them, that they might know him carnally. Now, you don't have to use your mind all that much to know what that meant. It's terrible. It's the same thing that happened in Sodom in Genesis chapter 19. Now, the man that owned the home did not deliver the Levite into their hand. They prevented him from being destroyed by these perverted men from Gabeah. But instead, and it's hard for us to even comprehend this, his young wife was given to them and they ravished her to death. They killed her. And in response to this moral evil, the Levite is rightly indignant and angered. And in a sense, he sends out a message on social media. Not really. He takes the body of his wife, he dismembers her body, and he sends it to all of the heads of the tribes of Israel. And we look at that and we think, what on earth is going on here? But it is a message to them that they cannot ignore. It's like there's no way to look away from this. They have to be confronted by this moral evil. They have to respond to what has taken place. And it was intended to shock. It was intended to outrage them. And in outrage, the nation gathers together as one man. The text says in Judges chapter 20, they all gather together. The 11 tribes, they get together and they have 400,000 men armed for war who basically say, this is horrible. This must be dealt with. This injustice has to be dealt with. They fulfill the command of Ephesians 4, 26, be angry. And they are rightly angered by what they have seen. And so they gather together, united to demand justice. And it reminds us of an important truth. Point number one, if you're taking notes this morning, enforced justice is the proper response to evil and justice. It is right to enforce justice when there has been an evil injustice. So when the 11 tribes gather together to say this must be dealt with, and they are outraged and indignant, they're right. In fact, if you are not outraged by moral evil, it says something about the searing of your own conscience, And so they're rightly outraged by what they see, and they want justice. The difficulty, and I think we all can see this difficulty, not just in the text, but in our own hearts. The difficulty is finding the proper and just response to injustice. And religious people, Christians, have been thinking on this for millennia. 
It gets into the entire discussion of just war theory or the proper response to wickedness. How do you deal with wickedness? What is the right tool and what is the right measure of justice? And it is a far more difficult question than sometimes we fully realize. The people of Israel, in Judges chapter 20, they were right to be morally outraged by the outrageous sin of the people of Gabeah. And their initial response when they gather together is possibly the right first step. They see this moral evil, they gather together, they are united together in saying, what has happened is wrong and it needs to be dealt with. That's right. So they, they come together and they want to respond. And in response to the wickedness, Judges chapter 20 says that they gather a united force of 400,000 armed men. And they bring word to the tribe of Benjamin, the 11 tribes of Israel, come to the tribe of Benjamin, where the city of Gabeah was, and they bring word to them that this needs to be dealt with. And it, it's told to us in verse 13 of chapter 20. Look at this. They come to the city and they say, deliver up the men, the perverted men who are in Gabeah, that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. The people of the 11 tribes of Israel, they are seeking to fulfill the law of Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 19 and in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and other places as well, the law required capital punishment for these perverted people in Gabeah who had committed this moral atrocity. And so they come and they say to the tribe of Benjamin, you need to deliver these perverted men to us that we may put them to death. But imagine the picture. Behind the messengers are 400,000 armed individuals. You know, there is this saying, you probably heard it before, it's from the Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Anybody ever heard that saying before? It gives us this whole idea of lex talionis, the, the, the proper unfolding of the law. So what is this? Well, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth is that the punishment must fit the, anybody know? The crime, that there needs to be the proper level of punishment for the crime. Now, the crime was absolutely horrible, atrocious. And it needed to be dealt with. And the law said, these perverted individuals, they shall die. But behind the messengers, 400,000 armed men. So how do you think the tribe of Benjamin responded? Well, look at verse 13, Judges chapter 20. But the children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. Instead, the children of Benjamin gathered together from their cities to the city of Gabeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. Maybe it was the 400,000 armed men. But something about the way that this message was delivered to the people of Benjamin caused them to resist what the law was calling them to do. The law ordered that these perverted individuals in the city of Gabeah put, be put to death, but the men of Benjamin resist Israel's call for justice. And I think in this is something that we probably all can identify with. We do not always respond perfectly when we're angry. I see some nodding. I think probably some of you know that that's true. You've observed it in yourself. I've certainly observed it in myself. I do not always respond best when I'm angry. In fact, quite rarely, when I am angry, because of some event, do I enter into that with a reasonable level head. Very infrequently am I level-headed when I am angered by something. Typically, it's only after I have responded. You know, we, we call that initial response a reaction. After I've reacted, only after that do I find myself thinking, could I have handled that better? I'm sure some of you have asked yourself that question before. Could I have handled this situation better? Now, again, we're in this weird tension. There is a horrible moral evil that has been committed. Be angry. And the tension is, do not sin. And that is so hard. Because we are rightly indignant by moral evil. Could the 11 tribes of Israel have handled this better than dispatching 400,000 armed men to the city of Gabeah and calling for the tribe of Benjamin to deliver the perverted men of Gabeah over to them. They, they probably could have. They're rightly indignant, but their response 
maybe not the best. And, and instead of reconsidering how best to respond to the tribe of Benjamin and their resistance, the 11 tribes, they gather together to go to war against their brothers. Now we have a civil war. It's a difficult situation. It is right for Israel to respond. It would have been wrong for them to not respond. They must respond to the gross wickedness of Gabeah. Justice must be enforced when injustice, especially terrible moral evil like this, has been committed. But how do we respond justly to evil and justice? Outrageous immorality demands moral outrage, but moral outrage rarely results in a perfectly moral response. I think you'll agree. Point number two, if you're taking notes, the right tools and measures of justice are incredibly hard to judge. What's the right measure? What's the right tool to deal with the injustice that has come to pass? It's really hard to determine. This is why it would be very hard to be a judge. This is why some of you duck out of jury duty. Because I don't know that I want to be in that position of making the decision. It's, it's a hard place to be. Now, there was a similar circumstance, not identical, to what we have here at the end of the book of Judges, at the end of the previous book, the book of Joshua. There was a tribe among the children of Israel at the end of the book of Joshua who appeared to do something that was morally wrong against the law of God. So, 11 of the tribes, actually 11 and a half of the tribes, come together to go and deal with it. And they are going to go to war against their brothers because of some moral evil that has been committed. They're, they're on the verge, the brink of civil war at the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua, just as they are here in this passage. But now, fortunately, in that situation, they sent ambassadors ahead to confer with the tribe that they're about to attack, and they were able to navigate and negotiate the situation to where there was a peaceful resolution. They were able to deal with it. In this situation, that's not the case. The 11 tribes, they gather 400,000 armed men and they go to the tribe of Benjamin. They say, you need to deliver these perverted individuals to us that we may put them to death. That's what the law requires. And in the midst of that, the tribe of Benjamin, they stand against them. They resist. And now they go to war. And in the first two days of the battle, the Passage describes in Judges chapter 20 that 40,000 men of the tribes, the 11 tribes of Israel, die. 10% of their 400,000. 40,000 die. On the third day, they come and they nearly annihilate the tribe of Benjamin. They kill almost all of their 25,000 plus fighting force, only 600 men of the tribe of Benjamin are left. And not only do they kill the men of the tribe of Benjamin, but they basically do to the tribe of Benjamin what they had done to the Canaanites, and they almost completely annihilate the entire tribe of the children of Israel. And, and when we see this, I can't help but think of James in the New Testament says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. My wrath even though it might be justified, does not bring about the perfect righteousness of God. And, and it's such a difficult thing because we're confronted with these kind of situations in our lives on a rather frequent basis where there is a moral evil that has been done and we are angry about it as we ought to be, but then we're trying to figure out how do we deal with this moral evil in a righteous way? That's the challenge here in this passage. And then in the final chapter of Judges, Judges chapter 21, which I'm not going to go verse by verse through, there's an added level to this situation, an additional crisis, because now the 11 tribes of Israel have basically destroyed the tribe of Benjamin, and they've got to figure out how do we make it so that they are not extinct, if you will. And there are 600 men from the tribe of Benjamin that remain after the tribe is almost completely destroyed in chapter 20, but they have no wives for them. This is a problem. So the tribe of Benjamin is probably going to go extinct if they don't do something. So they go, well, we got we to gotta fix this situation. And their fix, when you read their fix, you go, what in the world is going on? Here's their fix. The 11 tribes do a roll call. 
was there any city that didn't come and help us fight against the tribe of Benjamin? They go, yeah, there was this city over here. Okay, let's go kill them and take their young virgin daughters and give them to the tribe of Benjamin. You're going, what in the world is going on? And then they don't have enough wives for the 600 men of Benjamin. So they go, well, we still got a problem. We don't have enough women. What should we do? Well, there's a feast that's taking place in the mountains of Ephraim. And so they say, all right, to you other tribe, you other men, the 600 that didn't have wives, you other men, you go hide in the bushes. And when you see a young virgin dancing, you just go take her and she'll be your wife. And you're reading this, you're going, what on earth is happening here? You go, how is this right How is this just? And the answer is the very last word of the book. Look at Judges chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Israel was no longer, at this point, one nation under God. They they no longer had God's rule and reign in their lives by his law directing them. They, They no longer had a corporate commitment to following out God's law. And what had spread throughout the nation was what we might identify today as moral relativism. That there was no right and true standard of what is right and true any longer for the people. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So they they all chose for themselves what they were going to do. And as long as they figured, well, it seems like a good plan to me, then they would do that thing. And and when you have conditions like that, when when moral relativism is the rule of the day, whether it was 3,200 years ago in Israel during the time of Judges, or it's in 2024 in the Western world that we live in, when you have that take place, point number three is true. Social chaos is the inevitable outcome of moral relativism. Now, there may be some that would argue against this statement, but it seems to be very true to me. And I don't see any other outcome. If there is no universal standard, no right and true standard of what is right and true, then society falls into disorder. At this time in Israel's history, they lacked a corporate commitment to God's law and There was little, if any, shared value system for the children of Israel. The people at this time, there was an erosion of authority. No one agreed that this group was over this group. So the tribe of Benjamin could say, who are you to rule over us? So there's no no moral authority. And this entire period of Israel's history is just another example, another testimony to Man's sinful fallenness, whether they are the Canaanite peoples who have rejected God entirely, pagan peoples, or they are the people of God, the children of Israel, who had the covenant with God and the law of God. This is just another testimony to man's sinful fallenness. It's a reminder that we live in a sinfully broken and fallen world. The the open of the book of Judges, it started with these words, Judges chapter 10 or 2, verse 10. Another generation arose after Joshua's generation that did not know the Lord or the work that God had done for Israel to bring them into the land. And then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's how this book started. They forgot God. They forgot his rule and his authority over their lives. And the children of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then the final word of this book is what we just read in chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And when you just govern yourself according to what is right in your own eyes, because we are fallen and our hearts are desperately wicked, when we live in a world like that, where everyone does what is right in his own eyes, then we fulfill what Solomon observed in Proverbs chapter 14. There is a way that seems right to a man and the end thereof is the way of death. It leads to destruction and chaos. And when we are confronted with gross immorality and injustice, as we observe in a fallen, sinful world every single day, especially at times like what happened a year ago on October 7th, when we are confronted with gross immorality, we're rightly outraged by it. It makes us so indignant and we desire and we demand justice. We want something to be done to fix this. But rarely 
are our desires and demands for justice satisfied? They're rarely satisfied because our best efforts at justice are tainted by our sinful, fallen nature. Our best attempts at justice are just that, their best attempts. And they frequently fall short or they go too far. Our best attempts at justice, just think about it, they frequently fall short or they go too far. And we're left in the tension. What is the right response to this wicked thing that has happened? So how do we answer the question? We find ourselves, when we see justice falling short or going too far, we're left with a pit in our stomach. We're left with like a pain in our chest and we're left with thought in our minds that says, is there no justice for evil? There is an answer to the question. I mentioned it last week and it's really how this whole book wraps up. Enforced justice is the proper response to evil and justice. So what is the answer to evil and justice? The wrath of God will be revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 tells us that's the answer. The wrath of God. That is what human evil deserves. That is what gross wickedness demands. The wrath of God of God, the righteous wrath of God. That's what the Bible calls it. The righteous wrath of God is the right answer to evil and justice. And Ezekiel, the prophet, he observed 2,500 years ago, twice in Ezekiel chapter 18, the soul that sins shall die. That's the demand of the righteous wrath of God and the law of God. The soul that sins shall die. And there's a part within us that says, that's true. There's a part within us when we see gross immorality and sin, we say there needs to be justice. There needs to be wrath. And Romans says the wages of sin is, anybody know? Death. The soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. This is a consolation and a comfort to those who have experienced evil in this world. Some of you have experienced malevolent evil in your life. And in you, there's a demand. There needs to be justice. But you know, it's fascinating because I've had conversations with people in our culture today who get upset at the biblical doctrine of hell. They're bothered by this. And you know what? You know what it's an indication of when someone does not like the doctrine of hell? It's an indication that they have not suffered malevolent evil against them. And, and how awesome that is. I'm grateful. I've not suffered malevolent evil against me. But there are many people right now and throughout history who have watched their own children be killed by someone else. Or they have watched their family members be ravished by someone. They've experienced extreme perversion and malevolence. And listen, the doctrine of hell is to them a comfort. Why? God will judge. That's what hell says. God will judge. It gives them hope that there will be a final accounting, that there will be a judgment. And and there's a part of us that says, yes, there's a part of us that says that needs to happen. There needs to be wrath. But in the consolation, In the comfort that God will pour out wrath upon ungodliness and unrighteousness, there is a devastating, fearful reality. And what is the devastating, fearful reality? Well, it's Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in that all is me and you. You see, it's easy for us to look at the moral evil of the perverted men of Gabeah or the moral evil of Hamas or the moral evil of fill in the blank, whoever it is, and to say that needs to be judged. But in saying that needs to be judged is an understanding and a recognition that that means I also ought to be judged. Well, I didn't do the same level of horror or wickedness that they did. doesn't matter. You see, there's this great story in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. There was a man, great name, Habakkuk. You know, probably that name will come back, I'm sure. If you're looking for a baby name, that's a great name. But Habakkuk was angry because he looked at his nation. He was like, my nation is totally filled with sin. They need to be judged. Has anybody ever felt that? Like there needs to be a judgment for sin. Anybody? I'm the only one? Okay. Well, good. There's a few like me that want people judged. Right? Right? So 
He looked at his nation. He says, God, you need to judge my nation. And God says, okay, I'm going to judge your nation. I'm going to use the Babylonians. He goes, oh, no, no, we're not that bad. I mean, we're really a lot. Come on, that's not very nice, Lord. Why would you do that? Well, you just told me that they should be judged. Yeah, but not that way. The, the fickleness of my own heart. In my moral outrage for sin, I realize that I deserve judgment also. And, and what is the answer? Well, we're going to partake of communion this morning. And, and in this, the bread and the cup is God's answer. Point number four, the cross is the only right remedy for sin. Wickedness must be judged. Sin must be dealt with. And, and what is the cross but perfect justice being poured out upon sin? Because in the cross, Jesus, who never sinned, became sin for me and for you, and God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus for sin, fulfilling the prophecy of the prophet Isaiah 700 years before Christ, who said this, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed or bruised for our iniquities, the punishment so that I could have peace with God came upon him, and by his stripes, I'm healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Don't miss this. This is, this is heavy. It's powerful. First question, how many of you have ever been angered by injustice? Okay, I think most of you. The rest of you are not listening. Pay attention. <laughs> how many of you were sickened by what happened on October 7th or 9-11? Okay morally outraged. Your moral outrage is a self-condemnation upon you. Let me read it to you, Romans chapter two. Paul says this, therefore you are without excuse. Whoever you are who judges, have you ever judged something as wrong, condemned it, damn that thing? Yes, we all raised our hands. You are without excuse. Whoever it is who judges, for in whatever you judge, you condemn yourself for you who judge, practice the same things. Do you not think, or do you think that you will escape the judgment of God? That's Romans chapter two. When I judge something as wrong and worthy of judgment, I am saying that there is actually a standard of righteousness and therefore unrighteousness must be judged. The sinful wickedness that is presented to us in the book of Judges is twisted and it is sickening. And unfortunately, the, the deliverers that come to try to deal with it, they are ineffectual and they themselves have problems. I mean, Samson and Gideon and Jephthah and go down the list. All of these deliverers that are coming to deliver from the sinful wickedness. It's like, really, that's the best that you have? And it's like, yeah, that's the best that you have. Why? Because the, the best of men are men at best and we're all still fallen. And when we see all of these things that, that come forward, these deliverers that come to deal with this problem, we're left going, is that all we have? We need someone to fix this. And that's exactly what Israel's gonna do. In the next book, two books from here, the book of 1 Samuel, what is Israel's response going to be to all of the wickedness and the ineffectual deliverers that came to them during the 350 years of the time of the judges? Their answer is to say, we need a king. If we just had someone to come and fix this, we need a king to deliver us. And the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, they're the story of a whole bunch of kings who all sucked. Pardon my French. Actually, it's not French. But anyway, so they, they were terrible. Even the best ones were David, the best king. What does he do? He commits adultery and murder to cover it up. And you're like, please, is there not someone to fix this? Can't we just have a good king? The problem is that all the kings that we're going to be presented with are of this world. And we need a king that's not of this world. That, that's where we're left, calling out for a king. And John in the New Testament, the Apostle John, he had a revelation. 
he saw a vision. What did he see? Let me read it to you. Revelation chapter 19. I'll try to wrap it up. We're going to partake of communion. John says this. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. How many of you want a deliverer who's faithful and true and he judges in righteousness? That's what I want. I want someone who judges righteously. John saw the revelation. And and what did he see? His eyes were a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which he will strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty God. And he, on his robe, had on his robe, on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We see the moral injustice of the world, like the people of Israel did 3,000 years ago during the time of the judges, and they say, we need someone to right this wrong. We need someone to fix this. And their response was, we need a king to rule over us. And then they got a whole bunch of kings, and they were all terrible. And they're left in this place longing for, yearning for someone to come who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords who's not of this world, who will rule in righteousness with faithful truth. And that's where we are, nine days out from a presidential election. And we say, there's all kinds of moral chaos and there's all kinds of problems. There's all kinds of issues. We say, we need someone to fix this and maybe this person will fix it. I'm here to tell you, probably not gonna happen. And actually, it's not gonna happen. Odds are zero. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And this is why Christians for millennia have prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now don't misunderstand. I'm not saying don't vote. I'm saying vote. I voted last Thursday. You should vote. But you should have moderated expectations because the kings of this world will always leave you saying, we need a king who's called faithful and true, the king of kings. And it should lead me and you, if we're Christians, to say, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Come quickly. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The awesome thing is that there on the cross, sin is punished. The wrath of God is poured out upon sin. Why? He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might receive his righteousness. And I'm going to invite Anthony and the team to come up. They're going to lead us in worship and we're going to remember his body that was broken for us, his blood that was shed for us in fulfillment of Isaiah's words. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment so that you and I could have peace with God was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Why? Because all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Anthony's gonna lead us in worship and if you have not received the bread and the cup for communion, the ushers will walk around and give them to you and after we've all received them, we'll partake together in just a moment. Father God, I pray that you would remind us again that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords and our desires for justice are only ultimately satisfied in you. And we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. There is social chaos in our world. It is the inevitable outcome of departing from the truth of your word, moral relativism. And there is only one answer for evil and sin. It is the salvation that is found only in you at the cross. We thank you that your body was broken, your blood was shed for us to deal finally and completely with sin. And someday, one day, you will establish your kingdom and there will be no more suffering and no more sin. And we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had broken it and gave thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together.
In the same manner, after they had eaten, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Lord, we know from the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, that without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of the stain of sin. But Jesus, you who knew no sin became sin for us. You took my sin, all the sin of the world upon yourself. Your body was broken, bruised. You shed your blood to atone for and deal with sin. You stood in my place, the place of my brothers and sisters here as a substitution so that you could give us your forgiving grace and your righteousness. God, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you that you are the one who puts away the enmity. You are the one who deals with sin entirely. And you are the one who will one day rule and reign with righteousness. God, I pray that your rule as our Lord and King would be evident in our lives and that you would help us to be ambassadors of your kingdom in this culture, in this place, at this time, to be lights shining in a dark place. And Lord, we do pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. And now may the Lord bless and keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.